This is the cheapest NVIDIA RTX series graphics card that you can buy. And it even comes with ray tracing support and I got this one for only $135. Let's see what games this GPU can run, if any. But before that, remember to subscribe to the channel and give us a like if you like GPU reviews. This is the NVIDIA RTX A400, or as I call it, the RTX 3030. That's probably what NVIDIA would have called it if they had released it for the gaming market. The A400 was launched on 16th of April 2024 and is built on the Ampere architecture, which is the same one that's on the NVIDIA RTX 3000 series. So in terms of architecture, it is relatively recent. However, the other specifications are quite underwhelming. The A400 is a heavily stripped down GPU, the GA107. This is the same chip in the RTX 3050 6 and 4 GB versions. Since the RTX 3050 is considered a cutdown RTX card, that would make the RTX A400 a cutdown of a cutdown in this case. For example, the 6GB RTX 3050 has 2,304 CUDA cores, while the 4GB version has 2,048 CUDA cores, but the A400 only has 768 CUDA cores. The difference in CUDA cores is more than twice what the A400 has. In terms of raw computing power, if we count in T-flops, then the A400 is once again defeated, since it has a measly 2.7 T-flops, while the 4GB RTX 3050 has 7.1. And the uncut version of the RTX 3050, that is the 8GB version, is higher at 9 T-flops. So safe to say, it's extremely cut down, but if you're looking at choosing a decent and powerful video card, then I have left links in the description with some of the best GPUs of 2024 on offer right now, so feel free to check them out. Now back to the A400. The other specifications are just as underwhelming as its core count since it only has 4 gigs of GDDR6 VRAM but despite the slight advantage of halving GDDR6, it is limited to a 64-bit bus which is extremely small and limits the bandwidth to only 96 gigabytes a second. However, despite its shortcomings, the RTX A400 has its advantages and its uses. For example, I recently received a Minis Forum MS-01 Mini PC and it has a PCIe slot into which you can insert a graphics card. But it has to be a single slot and a low profile card at the same time. And most recent cards don't offer low profile options so when it comes to miniature PCs, the A400 is perfect. Another thing the A400 does best is efficiency. It only requires 50 watts of juice and that is a very small requirement considering GPUs usually require 4 times that at 200 watts and over and require external connectors to get power while the A400 gets all the power it needs from the PCIe slot it's connected to without need for any external connections. Now moving on to the tests, let's start with the synthetic benchmarks. Rendering the video in DaVinci Resolve takes an extremely long time to render. And since I recently tested the old GTX 780Ti and the R9 290X against similar renders, when compared to them, the A400 renders twice as slow as the GTX 780Ti, an 11 year old GPU. And by the way, if you haven't watched the GTX 780Ti versus the R9 290X video, be sure to take a look. It turned out to be quite interesting. Now back to DaVinci, you can move around on the timeline quite easily and working on 1080p videos won't be too hard to accomplish with the A400. Next, we have a superposition test. In this benchmark, the A400 scores a measly 1700 points, which is laughable because the same test on a GTX 1050 Ti gets us 2145 points. But to give it a bit of an edge, I overclocked and undervolted it as far as it could go to see if we could get better performance. I overclocked the memory to plus 2000 MHz and the core clock accepted to go as far as plus 238 with an undervolt at 900 mV which actually gave us a small increase in performance on the superposition benchmark compared to earlier. But judging by GPU-Z, the memory bandwidth seems to have increased from 96 to 128 GB a second, which is a 30 plus percent increase that should net us some extra performance, so most of the tests and benchmarks were with these OC settings applied. Let's move on to the gaming benchmarks where all games are tested in 1080p. Let's start with competitive titles. The first is CS2 at low settings with 2x MSAA. The card produces surprisingly decent performance by managing to stay above 100 FPS, which is a playable experience, and according to the results of the benchmark, we get 129 FPS on average. 
to give a more detailed picture of how it fares as a recent release, I decided to compare it to a GTX 1650 Super in some of the gaming benchmarks and the 1650 Super is about twice as fast as the A400 using the exact same settings. The next game is Apex Legends playing on low settings. When flying over the map, we are hovering around 70 FPS. And once we're on the ground, we get around 80 to 100 FPS with some fluctuations depending on the scene. The next game is the finals, playing on low using DLSS set to performance. Despite worrying about how the game would look due to DLSS performance on 1080p, it wasn't that bad and we got averages around 70 FPS with minor drops to 60s on some more demanding scenes, nevertheless it was still a very playable experience and I managed to get some kills. Atomic Hearts was next, using medium settings and DLSS set to balanced. We got averages hovering around 45 to 50 FPS, so it's not that bad for a single person shooter. The next game is Control on medium settings, but with DLSS set to quality. And yes, the game runs well enough with averages in the 35 to 45 FPS range, with the highs on less demanding scenes and drops on the more epic scenes with explosions and such. But it's playable. The next game is Cyberpunk 2077 on low settings using FSR set to quality. We get around 30 FPS on average, with some minor scenarios going above 40 FPS, but I wanted to compare it against the 1650 Super which gets up to 65 FPS and averages 60 FPS most of the time. Then I also tested the non-overclocked settings to see if there was a difference. As mentioned earlier, I had managed to undervolt it to 900 millivolts and increase the frequency of the chip which meant the GPU was now using 40 watts instead of 50 watts and performed better at the same time with an increase of 3 to 4 FPS which isn't much but it's still better than nothing. And since FSR 3 and FSR frame generation were recently added to Cyberpunk, I wanted to see if it would help us get better performance since we were basically stuck on the 30 FPS range. So with frame gen on, we get around 50 FPS on average, but despite the FPS counter showing higher numbers than before, it honestly doesn't feel like a native 50 FPS experience. And as you can see on the frame time graph, the game isn't smooth at all. The frame time delay caused by frame gen is higher, making the game feel worse than playing on native 30 FPS, and it feels extremely unstable and unpleasant to look at, and FSR doesn't help since it ruins the way native 1080p would look, and there is noticeable artifacting while moving the camera around. This being an RTX card, however, means that we have access to DLSS, and in this case, it is the superior upscaler and it is what I would recommend. With DLSS set to balanced, it looks fairly decent and it runs better without frame gen lag to slow it down. I also dared to enable some ray tracing and frame generation just to see if I could and it was as bad as you would assume with a 23 FPS slideshow and without frame gen it's even worse at 15 to 17 FPS, so not recommendable. Let's move on to the next game, Days Gone on medium settings. At the very beginning of the game, we get an average of 40 FPS, so it's playable, but there might be drops below 40 FPS to 30 FPS in more demanding scenes. The next game is God of War Ragnarok, which is a long-awaited sequel that finally made its way to PC to be enjoyed on 4K resolution at 60 FPS, but not with the A400. Best we can do with this GPU is 1080p low settings with DLSS set to quality, which gets us an acceptable 30 to 40 FPS. The next game is Elden Ring on medium settings. Without FSR or any upscalers, just default 1080p, we get over 35 FPS average, but to be honest, I expected better. Because in the last video, I tested the R9-290X, an 11-year-old flagship which gave us the same FPS at ultra settings. If you haven't seen the video, I advise you to watch it. The next game is Far Cry 5 on ultra, and we get over 35 FPS average, but I would recommend lowering some of the settings to get above 50 FPS, which should give you a better gaming experience than 35 FPS. The next game is The Ghost of Tsushima, on medium settings, with FSR set to quality, 
we barely get to stay above 30 fps and sometimes we get major drops below 30 as you can see on the 0.1% lows. Moreover, when comparing it to the 1650 Super, it is a significantly better gaming GPU since the A400 is slower than the base 1650, let alone the Super, so no surprises there. The A400 is an RTX card, so you can utilize DLSS set to balanced and turn on frame gen to get better performance, but not by much since we get 40 FPS average, which is still lower than the 1650 Super without DLSS or frame gen enabled. The next game is Hogwarts Legacy set to low and DLSS set to quality. I didn't really expect much, but the card was able to surprise me with averages of up to 50 FPS, but that's only on the starting area, so Hogsmeade will probably be worse. Next was Horizon Forbidden West on low settings, with FSR set to balanced. The hair on Aloy has a lot of ghosting and shimmering caused by FSR, so I included DLSS just to see if it looked better, and without a doubt it did. However, the only disadvantage is it's only for RTX cards, unlike FSR, which supports all GPUs. As for the frame rates, we got console like performance of the 30 to 35 FPS averages, which was somewhat playable. The next game was Mafia 1 Remake on low settings with no upscalers since the game has none. We get averages of 40 FPS with a smooth frame time graph so it's quite playable. Spider-Man Miles Morales was next, playing on medium settings with DLSS set to quality. We get averages starting from 45 to 50 FPS on different parts of the city which is quite good for a card like this. The next game is Need for Speed Unbound set to low with DLSS balanced. The game runs quite well but it doesn't look as good as previous NFS games on low settings, but we get 45 to 50 FPS during gameplay, so it's playable with this card. The next game is Remnant 2. Using the potato graphic setting, which is the lowest settings you can use on the game, given that this is a recent title, you will need a better GPU to get better visuals, but if you don't care about that, then the A400 gets averages of 45 to 50 FPS without the eye candy. Next is Hellblade 2, also set to low, with DLSS set to ultra performance, and as you can see, it still struggles to run the game and barely gets 20 FPS, with some drops to under 10 FPS to 6 FPS in cutscenes, and due to the upscaler, the image gets so blurry it's hard to tell what is happening on the screen. The next game is the recently released Silent Hill 2 remake on low settings, with DLSS set to performance. The game does work slightly better with this GPU than Hellblade 2, but the performance is still poor with averages around 23 to 25 FPS, and the aggressive upscaling doesn't do the image fidelity any favors, and there are dips below 10 FPS in some scenes. Testing with DLSS on ultra performance, we got a slight increase in FPS to averages of 27 to 30 FPS, which is barely playable. But Shadow of the Tomb Raider on medium settings with DLSS set to quality does a lot better with this GPU with an average of 45 FPS, which is playable. The Last of Us on low settings with DLSS quality seems to potentially max out the VRAM, but even so, we get around 28 to 35 FPS on less demanding scenes, and if we compare it with the 1650 Super, there is a difference of about 15 to 20 FPS, which shows the 1650 Super is clearly better. The next game is the classic Witcher 3, playing on medium settings with DLSS set to balanced. For a remastered 2015 game, I expected we would get better performance, but the A400 can only do 35 to 40 FPS. The next game is Uncharted 4, medium settings with FSR set to quality. I couldn't find DLSS in this game, but it is available while using other GPUs, so it has to be an A400 driver issue. The good thing is, the visual quality isn't that bad with FSR in this title as it is well implemented, and we get around 30 FPS with sometimes getting near 40 FPS, which is basically a console-like experience, so it's enough to be playable. 
The next game was Warhammer 40k Space Marine 2 on low settings with DLSS set to balanced. This is a recently released title and it shows, given the poor performance and the use of upscaling ruins the way the game is meant to look, with aggressive smoothening and even the explosions look really low quality in these settings, and we barely managed to stay above 30 FPS with averages of 28 to 33 FPS. And finally, Alan Wake 2 on low settings with DLSS set to balanced. Surprisingly, Alan Wake 2 seems to run decently well on the A400 with a playable 35 to 38 FPS, and the game still looks good even on low settings. As expected, the RTX A400 turned out not to be a good gaming GPU, but you can still play competitive titles fairly well with it. However, if you're buying a GPU specifically for gaming, then a used RTX 2060 would cost about the same and would give you 290% more performance and if you want something new, then the RTX 4060 would up that number to 436% which will definitely be a superior gaming experience. If you're on the market for a GPU, I have left links to some of the best GPUs on offer in the description. Give us a like and comment if you plan on getting the low-profile RTX card and tell us why. See you in the next one.